to the presentation, I also wanted to thank our corporate sponsors of tonight's webinar, um, the Nature Conservancy and the Colony Group. We couldn't do all of this work without them, so we are very appreciative of that. So then tonight our presentation is going to be a really interesting topic and one that we have yet to cover in our webinar series. Um, the presentation is titled Making Home Beautiful, an Underestimated Approach to Coping with Climate-Induced Displacement. And we're lucky to have two wonderful speakers tonight that will be working together to give this presentation. So I will first introduce Dr. Devorah Newmark, um, currently living in Inqualuit. Um, Dr. Newmark is an interdisciplinary artist, researcher, educator, and community engaged practitioner with over 30 years of contemplative practice. Newmark is also a Yale School of Public Health certified climate change adaptation practitioner. They completed an Arctic Winter College Fellowship in 2021 with the focus on climate change induced migration. Newmark was a faculty member in the Goddard College MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts Program from July 2003 through May 2021, where they co-founded the Indigenous in Decolonial Art Concentration. Their Social Sciences and Humanities Research Counts Council of Canada's funded research creation PhD titled Radical Beauty for Troubled Times in Voluntary Displacement in the Unmaking of Home was an inquiry into the relationship between the traumas associated with forced dislocation and the deliberate beautification of home. Newmark's creative work includes projects about climate and environmental justice and about beauty in the built environment for the forcibly displaced. Then we are also joined by Stephanie Acker, MPA. She is a research associate at the Migration Policy Center at the European European University Institute in Assessment, Measurement, and Evidence Consultant at um, UNICEF Innocenti, a global office of research and foresight. She has worked at a local, federal, and international level to improve outcomes for vulnerable populations. Previously, Stephanie directed the Bureau of Homeless Services, Emergency Shelter, and Housing for the Boston Public Health Commission, and served as a policy analyst and national public information officer for the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Stephanie was a United States Presidential Management Fellow. She holds a bachelor's degree in social work from Gordon College and a master's in public administration from Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. So those are our two wonderful speakers that we have ready to present for us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and pass the floor over to them. I encourage you all to input questions in the chat throughout the presentation and we will have a Q&A session at the end. So take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Devora Newmark and I am a second generation Holocaust survivor. I'm an independent interdisciplinary research and artist based in Iqaluit, which means place of plenty fish in Inuktitut in Nunavut in the Eastern Canadian Arctic, where I've also been working on the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, as well as Inuit and Northern Economic Development and Social Wellbeing. As we heard, I'm joined by my colleague, Stephanie Acker, who's a research associate at the Migration Policy Center at the European University based in Florence, Italy. And we really appreciate the fact that she's up so late with us today. Thank you so much, Emily, for making all the arrangements to host us today and for making the recording available to those who'll be watching in the coming days. And for those joining us live, and those who will see the recording, we're very honored to join you. Stephanie and I have been working on a joint focus about the role of beauty in the built environment, specifically if and how making the spaces that people live in beautiful, how it matters for individuals who've experienced forced displacement. Today, we'll focus on how this process could be relevant for those dislocated due to climate change. Forced displacement for refugees is not the same as climate migration, and we acknowledge that. But we do think that there are many ways that the aesthetics in the built environment correlates for these individuals and communities as well. Next slide. So while Stephanie and I will mostly be addressing home beautification and beauty in the built environment, we thought that we would briefly set the stage by pointing to the direct and indirect ways that climate change leads to displacement. Climate-induced displacement arises from multiple pathways, encompassing both immediate and underlying factors. On the one hand, it materializes directly because of climatic extremes, such as weather events, 
that wreak havoc on individual homes and increasingly destroys entire localities. And I could give many examples of that even within the last year. Simultaneously, a more nuanced indirect process unfolds as climate change exacerbates issues like physical and mental health, water scarcity, food insufficiency, and others, and thus compels individuals and communities to seek new prospects and livelihoods outside their habitual environments. It's noteworthy that the 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius confirmed that, quote, multiple drivers and embedded social processes influence the magnitude and pattern of livelihoods and poverty and the changing structure of communities related to migration, displacement, and conflict, end quote. In this slide, we see just the numbers of the forced displacement caused by disasters. With climate change increasingly driving displacement, these drivers and social processes are key to both understanding the displacement impacts and the potential adaptation mechanisms. Next slide. Thank you, Devorah. Um, so let's just take a step back um, and what we mean by beauty. We'll just anchor with, with that as we talk about beauty in the built environment. So by this, we don't mean art or nature, but this is a term coined by art philosopher Arthur, da Arthur Danto um, of third realm beauty. And this refers to the deliberate attempt to make something beautiful. So this can happen on a community level, uh, but it's also the stuff of just everyday life the ordering of a home, the sweeping of a floor, the placement of an object, any deliberate action to make the world around us more pleasant. Um, and we'll start by sharing a few strands of research. So is this common? Does this happen in displacement? So a review um, that looked at the literature of um, the academic literature of how refugees make home, um, how they relate to it, how they make it, um, found that there were um, many in more than half of these studies, there were examples of, of beauty. So these were the studies on refugee homemaking and at least, um, at least half of them had one or more example of this happening in displacement. And what's unique about this is that this did not just happen, um, it wasn't just refugees who were living um, or had what's called a durable solution, which would be like a permanent long lasting legal rights to a resident uh, residence. Um, it happened across all different legal contexts. So that includes people who are seeking and waiting for an asylum um, application or adjudication process, people who are in protracted situations and kind of a, a limbo. Um, and so this, what it, refer, it infers is that actually making the built environment beautiful spans displacement and it um, spans the temporariness of a situation. I'll read one quote um, from Elizabeth Wageman, who worked with um, individuals who had been displaced by an earthquake um, in Chile and Peru. Uh, just to give you a flavor for what this looks like. So she said, families transformed their temporary environments, new and bright colors, design fences, decorative elements, and the use of familiar materials all contributed to create personalized houses, easy to identify in a temporary settlement. Although families knew they would be evicted from these temporary settlements in the midterm, they put effort and care into modifying their temporary houses, showing that they're more than mere shelters to them. So this gives you a bit of flavor of what this can look like in displacement. Um, so I want to uh, share a different example from post uh, Katrina um, with the founder, Denise Thornton, um, who founded an organization called Beacons of Hope, talked about the immediate attention to beautification so quick after displacement um, from Katrina was key to everything, um, which is quite a bold, uh, quite a bold statement. These um, simple acts of beauty, such as planting flowers and attempt to halt the government's plans to uh, demolish the neighborhood. Um, she said landscaping was the first thing in trying to rebuild, uh, planting flowers, restoring shutters, applying new paint. Um, for Denise and many thousands who got involved in this neighborhood revitalization process, these simple acts um, signaled 
actually there's life here. We can rebuild. Um, it helped to recapture some semblance of what uh, was lost. They worked to make things look like they looked before. It made people feel good. It gave them hope um, and ultimately um, drew them together to help them problem solve. So it's had a bigger impact um, on on the community, um, on the community at large. So upon reflecting back, she said this set an example for the entire community that was instrumental in attracting people back to the neighborhood. So they also worked to rebuild green spaces. Um, that was key to this kind of early revitalization process when it wasn't sure whether people would come back and the neighborhood would be rebuilt. But these um, acts of kind of restoring the built environment of making things look beauty, beautiful, having block parties, planning sessions um, were ways that kind of invited people to participate in this, um, in this revitalization. Um, she said, so the home beautification process set an example for the entire community, it was instrumental in attracting them back um, and their level of interest to uh, to return and determine the viability of returning, particularly because the neighbor had been marked for destruction. So it's this powerful act of actually saying, there is life here, we're not gonna destroy this neighborhood. So these simple acts um, can have quite this powerful effect. I'll share this, we're gonna switch to a different strand of research that actually Devorah, uh, Devorah led. So in this participatory research project with 200 individuals who had personal or intergenerational experience with involuntary displacement, found that the disorientation that can be caused by the loss of home could be eased by this simple repetition um, of actions of beautification of one's home. Um, and the findings of this emphasize that through these fit like deliberate physical acts of home beautification, the pain and loss of home is like absorbed into the aesthetic experience. Um, one of the participants, Alexi, shared um, this quote that is so powerful. She said, as refugees, we lose our sense of beauty. And when that happens, we lose our sense of everything, of life itself. And as Devorah found in her research, if the corollary of Alexi's perception is true, that a recovery of the sense of beauty aids in this recovery and engagement with life, then like the aesthetics of how someone makes home um, as just the most immediate area of kind of personal action, they cannot be dismissed as merely decorative or superficial. They actually mean quite, um, quite a lot more. So I'm going to pivot now to share some emerging findings from a storytelling collaborative that Stephanie and I are working on that looks at the intersection of climate change, displacement, and the importance of climate and nature as part of the beautifying home process. Because of the current situation in Israel-Palestine, we have decided to anonymize the participants in order to protect them, including a Palestinian storyteller and artist who I'm fortunate to be able to call my friend for the past 19 years. This friend has been documenting the gardens created and maintained by first and second generation refugees living in an anonymized Palestinian refugee camp. My friend's parents were forcibly displaced from their village in 1948, and he himself was born in the camp in the 1980s. Geographically, the camp covers less than half a kilometer in total. There are more than 10,000 inhabitants. In addition to the intractable, intractable political dynamics and the ongoing humanitarian catastrophe being played out across Gaza and the occupied West Bank, the camp, like all the Middle East, is increasingly impacted by rising temperatures and changing weather patterns. Here is what my friend recently shared. The camp where I live suffers from many problems, including overcrowding and narrow housing. One of the most important of these problems is water. People in the camp get two opportunities to fill the water tanks located above their houses every 15 days. He continued, when I asked people about the importance of having gardens, 
They said that the gardens provided a good place to turn to with climate change in Palestine. The temperatures, he says, are rising dramatically these days and people are not used to such high heat. The gardens provide some relief, but with the water shortage, it's not always easy to keep the plants alive. What we are finding in these various initiatives, both with the Palestinian example in the camps, as well as with the post New Orleans project, is that the deliberate beautification of the built environment seems to have therapeutic benefits that are quite meaningful to displaced individuals and communities. Professor Susan Bryson proposed that one of the things that individuals who have survived trauma must do to endure is to shift the weight of someone else's interpretation of their lives and the focus on, quote, what has been done to me, end quote, to something akin to, quote, what I have done and can do, end quote. What we find is that the act of beautifying one's home is of significant value towards making this specific shift. Beautification can support several processes ne necessary for healing, amongst which are the following three. Personal agency to cope with the lack of control, the use of the physical, to express complexity. And the third, remembering and honoring one's past home while creating home anew. We propose that these processes are most helpful in building self-sufficiency following forced displacement and climate migration. So let me take these one at a time. First, when experiencing the chaos of disorder and destruction, and when we do not feel capable of exerting any control over the conditions of our homes, creating or retreating to a scale of intimacy can comfort us. Home beautification allows for taking up space and affords a sense of personal agency to cope with the loss of control. As one resident said, when I feel nervous, I come to the garden. And another neighbor said, my garden is a place for family and friends to gather inside the camp, despite the limited space. Second, to think with and express through the material world and to learn to say what cannot be said expands the range of feeling and experience for someone who's lived through trauma. The deliberate appreciation of beauty through physical gestures is therefore a rather useful and straightforward way to express complexity. Another gardener said, welcome to my humble garden. Here I plant roses and there are other roses on the roof of the house. I wish I had my land to farm. I love farming very much. Unfortunately, I do not have space to fill my desire so I put roses in old plastic and iron containers. And finally, the crux of beauty making significance is in the making. The processual nature of beautification can provide tangible ways to remember previous homes, to honor the loss of one's home and to create home anew in the here and now, while simultaneously honoring that home that isn't anymore. My friend shared, quote, everyone agreed being refugees from different Palestinian villages that caring for agricultural land represents for them a memory of their villages from which they were expelled in 1948. Caring for the garden reminds them of the land in the occupied villages. If we return to the quote that Stephanie shared from Alexi in a previous project, as refugees, we lose our sense of beauty. And when that happens, we lose a sense of everything, of life itself. These emerging findings from the Palestinian garter, gardens show how profound the ripple effects are. They imply we cannot think of aesthetics as only decorative or superficial because finding ourselves with a new sense of beauty 
means that we can find a way to exploring life again. Over to you, Stephanie. Um, no matter how many times I can still forget to unmute myself. Um, so we wanted to take a moment to actually explore. Um, we want to talk more about how this power of aesthetics and beautification, um, what it means for those uh, displaced by uh, climate-induced disasters or climate change. But we thought we'd pause for a second um, to actually have a little bit of time for dialogue. And we wanted to pose one question questions. So on the screen, you'll see what it is. Um, and I'll read it. It says, what is the one special um, so-called non-essential object or thing that you would want to take with you? Should you have to be, or should you be forcibly displaced on account of a climate emergency and why? So I want to unpack that just a little bit. So you or someone, you know, may have actually already experienced this, or perhaps you work with someone who did. Um, this is increasingly common, right? My family, um, was in California. So every year it seems like there's either I must evacuate for a fire reason or very close to that. Um, so if you have something, um, we're, I'm going to give you actually a couple minutes uh, in this world where we're really busy. It's actually nice to just have a little bit of time just to think, and this is what we'd like you to think about. So um, uh, you can write it down if that's helpful, um, or you can just kind of imagine uh, what you might choose, what your selection would be, and um, try to be as detailed as possible possible when you think about this object or thing, um, consider its shape, its color, its weight. Um, think about um, how you initially, came, this came into your possession, how long you've had it, where do you keep it? Um, and then try to turn your attention to like, what does it mean to you um, and why? What does it represent? What would be your motivation for like, I want to select this? Um, so I'm gonna, I will actually, I'm gonna set a timer. We're gonna take just five minutes. Um, so again, jot that down. And so again, we're thinking about what if you had to leave and you could bring one thing with you that was not essential, but you were able to bring it, what would that item be? Um, why, what does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it look like? Um, that is the question in the instructions. I'm gonna set a timer for five minutes and then we'll circle back um, then and would love for you to share or reflect as you feel comfortable. For those of you who may have just joined, there's just a couple of minutes left. Their question on the table is, 
what is the so-called non-essential one special object or thing that you would want to be able to take with you should you be forcibly displaced on a climate on account of a climate emergency and why and Stephanie is going to join us. Let us know when the time is up and then we'll open the floor to hear your reflections. Okay, that is um, that is our time. So um, people have already started to populate the chat. Um, we'd love if either you put your answer there, um, if you'd be willing to share, or if you didn't write it, um, we'd love to know what came to people's minds. And um, I think it's probably fine. There's a few of us, you can um, just start talking, um, or I can call on you uh, Lois. And if you could, um, you guys might all know each other, but we don't. So if you could just say your name, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lois Cody and I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. And the thing I would take with me, even if I had to leave everything else behind, is my box of family pictures. Everything in there is... Um, pictures or written written things like greeting cards that bring the people alive for me the handwriting especially with the pictures and the pictures bring the places alive and it all lives inside me in color and vibrantly and having the pictures always brings me to places that I may not be able to go to may not exist anymore my old man of the mountain picture is he's gone. So that's what would come with me no matter what else left behind that had would have to come. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Someone else. I'll jump in. My name is Paul Friedrichs. I can't see anybody else. Uh, maybe we want to take the screen shot off oh, so that we can yeah. see each other. There we go. Um, now I can see if I can. There we go. Hello, everybody. 
Uh, so I put it in the chat, but um, it was completely random because I wouldn't have thought it was that important to me, but I have a little statuette of a rhinoceros on a shelf next to my bedside. And it just sort of came to me because that would make me feel of that place, being in that place in my own bed, in my own bedroom. Um, and it's decorative. Um, and, uh, you know, I would have said it's not very important to me, but uh, if, if someone had picked it up and, and asked about it, but um, when I'm thinking about it, it just reminds me of being in this place. So something that it reminds me of being in my own personal space that I've enjoyed. Thanks. Thank you. I can um, read a few other comments from the chat here that we've received. Um, we've had two mentions of dogs um, as a means of hope and keeping oneself busy and mind protected. Um, Semra Itor shared one of her dad's paintings as well as a quote from a project she did in Manchester, New Hampshire um, with a youth photo voice participant who is a refugee from Africa. After taking a photo of her neighborhood in Manchester, she wrote of her new home. I love this picture because I think it is beautiful. It shows the beauty of the west side of Manchester. It shows that some people's thoughts about the west side are wrong. If you are looking for the good in something, you will find it. But if you are focused on the bad, you will only see the negative. And then there's another comment here about another family photo. I just thank you for reading that. I just I just want to say two things. First of all, thank you to Devorah and Stephanie for I can't thank you enough for this talk. I'm actually I'm grieving for my dad right now. He just passed away and he was a, a physician, an immigrant and um, an artist. <laughs> so it's just that the um, talking about this is so comforting and I can't imagine how healing it is in any number of situations. Um, so I mentioned, like Emily read, I would take one of my dad's paintings because he combined art and medicine, I think, in such a profound way. And I'm trying to do some of that in my own life. And then the other thing I said I would take is this photo, which I wish I could share with you. And maybe Emily can post it to our New Hampshire Healthcare Workers Group later. Um, exactly capturing what you're talking about, a refugee to Manchester, most of the participants in this project were taking pictures of problems, in quotes, in their built environment. And this young woman who had been through tr unspeakable trauma took a photo of the beauty, the beauty of just simple signage and things that she felt made her neighborhood beautiful. And um, I never, ever have forgotten that photo. I look at it every day, especially in times of trouble in my own life. So I'll try to share that with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Summer. That's so moving. Anyone else want to share? I'm going to share mine. Um, I have two. Um, the one that I, the one that I really want to say um, is that what I really love, the non-essential thing I'd want to bring, is my kitchen aid mixer. Um, I, I moved to Italy a few years ago and I did not bring that because that seemed frivolous and like it would not fit in our suitcase. And I don't think the power would work. Um, but I miss it so much. Um, and if it, I was really going with something completely non-essential, um, I want to bring that because I think it is so beautiful. And to me, it like represents the, um, both like the actual kind of nourishing of people, but to me, it's like often like made for cakes and things that are celebratory and the um, the ways that our food is not just about calories, but about the occasion. Um, and, and it, it, but it's also so heavy. So I immediately dismissed it because I'm a very practical person. And I was like, well, that would not be, <laughs> that cannot come. It's far too, it's far too big. Um, but my, my second thing, uh, which when I tapped into kind of my very like logistical minded brain, um, uh, was this, um, I have this journal that, um, my uh, partner gave to me when we uh, first got married and he's written me like little love notes. And then in it, I keep these pictures of um, my kids and kind of the same as Lois. It just, there's something like, I don't know, I, I'd hope my, my people would still be with me, but there's something that is so sentimental and grounding. And again, kind of connects me to like my like history of people who are closest to me. Um, so that is what I, I shared. Um, anyone else want to share 
or willing to share. Okay, um, you can put it in the chat. So as you can see, um, I'm gonna pull back up my screen one second here. Um, so we can see that the aesthetics uh, kind of can play all these different roles. Um, the pr preservation of memories, the kind of con conti continuity of identity, some sense of values, ownership, it has all of these um, kind of all of these benefits to it. So the displacement do, um, sorry, um, the displacement due to climate change um, and climate change impacting those who are already displaced populations are really complex challenges. Um, but aesthetics in the built environment and home beautification has these kind of great potential in supporting people and how they make home again. Um, it can be empowering to individuals and communities to reclaim control, uh, to recreate a sense of belonging that has kind of a, again, a healing and therapeutic power. And so by fostering um, emotional well-being and cultural continuity, resilience, strengthen, uh, resilience strengthens adaption and recovery efforts. Devora, do you want to? I'm so sorry. I was muted. Okay. <laughs> I, I took a cue from you earlier. Um, <laughs> so we think that these examples have some broader implications for policy and practice. Much of the language in research and policy on displacement depicts displacement as a condition that is almost exclusively associated with victimhood, suffering, and anonymity. And without taking away any of the suffering associated with these displacements, the examples that Stephanie and I are sharing today of home beautification and the concurrent focus on aesthetics in the built environment counter these erroneous narratives in that they are forward moving, intentional and planned. They are actions taken by refugees. They consist of verbs describing what they are doing, not adjectives describing what has been done to them. And that goes directly to the quote that I shared earlier from Susan Brisson. And they highlight how displaced, how the displaced are creative agents and change makers in their own lives being not synonymous with the injustices that they've experienced. When someone is viewed as a change maker, the language about them is never solely, if at all, focused on their trauma or their loss, however that might be an undercurrent of their experience. We think that this can contribute to an increase in, for example, funding for climate migrants and greatly revamp policy processes so that the forcibly displaced are encouraged and supported to be active agents rather than be seen and treated as, treated as invisible actors. So based on our research to date, we think that prioritizing aesthetics in the design and implementation of climate resiliency initiatives and recovery scenarios can significantly enhance emotional healing, preserve cultural identities, promote community adhesion amongst cohesion amongst those affected by climate displacement um, involving government at all levels, NGOs and healthcare workers. Um, we're very motivated by this quote by Arthur Danto, the one who coined um, third realm beauty. And he says, well, beauty might be optional for art. It is not an option for life. It is a necessary condition for life as we would want to live it. And so if we assume this is true and you know, we're in a science world, as many um, of you, uh, we kind of want to, given the finding state, they're, they're still limited. We have these questions and things we want to continue to explore. So one is how do we scale up this inquiry of what these initial findings seem to promote? And um, what does it mean in the earliest stages of displacement when people are, um, they haven't been there for a long time, it's still potentially very temporary. What does it look like then in the midst of that chaos? Uh, two, what um, influence and relevance could it have for policy and design? We don't overlook the fact that it's um, at a policy level quite complicated. 
Um, how can healthcare workers deliberately integrate aesthetics into healing modalities for patients and clients who've experienced climate displacement? Is it a part of um, a social determinant of health? Does it have a role um, in what it looks like to live a healthy, thriving life? So we're gonna pause there because we wanted to just have more time for dialogue. Um, we um, That I think Emily is going to facilitate. So I will share stop sharing my screen. Um, but I'll put it up there. This is our contact details, so you can feel free to reach out to us. But um, we'd love to dialogue for a bit because we have a bit more time um, and we wanted to make sure we saved time for that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that really, really wonderful presentation. Um, I encourage folks to put questions in the chat or unmute yourselves and ask them. Um, we did just get the answer to the question that I will share these slides afterwards with the recording link um, so you all will have access to them. But if anyone has questions, I encourage you to unmute or if you want to put it in the chat, I can read it for you. I'll ask a question. Um, first of all, um, my name is Jennifer Thompson and Stephanie and Dr. Newmark, thank you so much for this really eye-opening um, uh, presentation, you know, we hear, especially now, we hear every day about um, people being displaced from their homes, um, you know, due to climate and due to um, other factors as well. Um, and but you never really think you think about food and water and electricity and clothing and things like that. But you never really think of, you know, what happens a few months down the line when all the news cameras leave. So I, I guess my question would be what what is the next big goal you know is the big goal um to just increase public awareness so that you know the timeline is different and people participate more in the later recovery phases um and you know or is it more policy is that more of an important goal um, right now? And then what would the specific policy priorities be? That's a great, That's a great question. Um, Devorah, feel free to jump in. Um, I'll, I will. So <laughs> I think the, um, well, Dvor, why don't you start? Okay, I'll start on the larger, the yeah, maybe I'll philosophical the level, and then leave Stephanie to uh, flesh in the details. Uh, we're actually working on some policy briefs uh, as we as we speak. So, um, I think one thing that I have kept in mind ever since I did the initial research as part of the research creation PhD was how much of the policy and the practice is rooted in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that we know about the hierarchy of needs is that the first iteration didn't even have aesthetics mm -hmm. named. And when he finally revised it to include aesthetics, he uh, ended up putting it in the top of the hierarchy, almost as part of the self-actualization. My research has shown that, in fact, if we don't reverse that pyramid and consider aesthetics as a base for the first instinct of response, then at least with the participants who took part in all the different events that I um, uh, convened, the individuals who didn't have access to that quality of aesthetics or the attention because perhaps the policy didn't allow them to personalize their, uh, you know, their uh, temporary housing. Um, the trauma of the displacement in that first generation actually becomes a post memory of the second and third generations. And that furthermore, if through deliberate frames of either performance art or community engaged practices, 
we can create a schema of home beautification for the second and third generations who had not had that possibility of learning the imperative of beauty in the first generation, right? Then these events, these contexts can actually repair in the second and third generation. It is as powerful as that. So how do we go about revising Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and call it out for how it does that, that pyramid does such a disservice for individuals and communities. And, you know, we saw that in the very first image of the, of the side deck where we have the refugee um, tents and here are women who are governing that tent, the UN issue tent with incredibly beautiful cloth, right? In the refugee camp, there is this immediacy, this necessity, right? So we know that almost every, well, I would say every single person that has either had experience with forced displacement or worked with people who have experienced forced displacement get this immediately. They go, oh yeah, I've seen it. Like you've just said in the comments, right? Here is this Here's this uh, participant who took the photo and you're still living uh, somewhere with that photo because it's so powerful to you, right? So we know this to be true. We're trying to accumulate more and more data, scientific references in order to be able to, you know, bring that higher. But I think part of it is how locked in we are with this very tired uh, schema that doesn't really speak to the truth and doesn't speak to the needs of the displaced, whether it's climate displaced or war displaced um, in terms of how vital it is to life as, um, you know, as Danto would say. So with that larger frame, I'm just gonna turn it over to Stephanie and have her flesh out some of the details. Yeah, thank you, Devorah. Um... I think to build on that, what that means, Jennifer, is that I don't, we actually don't know though, like what that it's like, oh, here, it's not like, oh, this is the service model of like, this is what it means. And so this is the intervention that you do. We're, we're not at all to that. And we don't know, we don't know if that's it, because I think we're not at all saying beauty should be legislated in any way. But I think right now it is an understanding, like, is it prevalent? How are, how is it happening? And the initial data seems to say like, oh, this really matters. Uh, so we kind of, we know that. And as Devor said, kind of like at this gut level, people kind of react to it, like that it, it somehow means something. Um, we do think it has some policy implications. Um, one is largely that all of humanitarianism is gar like is dominated by <laughs> this hierarchy of like food, water, shelter, um, and that that's needed in the short term, but the, especially in refugee policy, that humanitarian aid is what is, it's like given for decades, it never quite shifts. Um, and so what does it look like to, what would it look like to value aesthetics early on in that process? And right, there's some challenges with that because right now we don't have government policy doing enough um, as it is um, on just even those basic, uh, those basic things. Um, and then we also think, right, there's um, also emerging research that also like more aesthetic places actually also help people move on. So there were some really interesting studies during COVID about more therapeutic um, shelters for individuals who had lost their home that actually helped them move on and um, kind of get on with their lives. That it didn't mean that they were more dependent and that uh, we think has a big policy implication for forced displacement that making something nicer isn't like gonna keep people there. It's actually going to help them and be therapeutic. Um, so those are just some of the initial policy implications, but I think um, what we're working on right now is to try to research to actually like really zero in on like, so what does this mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I think that these, these types of events that we're uh, speaking with you today uh, in really does bring us more and more awareness to the ways in which this matters, right? So when we pose those three questions about how to scale this up and how does, you know, how does it matter for healthcare workers, for example, 
we want to hear from you, right? We're, we're, this is a, uh, an approach that has to be participatory. It has to be inclusive of such a wide range of practitioners because that's how the information is going to be gathered. That's how the proof is going to be honed. Yes? Yeah, that, I, th I think that's a really good point. And um, thank you so much. And, you know, and, and just having this increased awareness um, as a practitioner gives me one more question to ask. And I never would have asked this question before this presentation. Um, and then depending on the answer, you know, you can maybe point the person in a certain direction um, to make sure that that need is met. But I never in a million years would have considered it before. So thank you so much for broadening my horizon. Are there any other questions that folks want to unmute themselves and ask? I, I would just point out that from a policy standpoint, you know, I, when I think of climate refugees and displacement, I think of the tension and the potential for unrest and even violence uh, when people are, are forced to leave their, <clears throat> their homes and possibly their country. Um, and in terms of management, of these huge refugee camps that may be may may likely be part of our future, um, that that the authorities trying to oversee these these places for refugees should be aware that aesthetics are important in meeting their basic needs, mm -hmm. and that perhaps by providing cans of paint or whatever it takes that the refugees will be able to live more at peace, as it were, mm -hmm. and be less likely to get violent in their anger about the forces that caused them to lose their homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, eco-terrorism or whatever will be less likely as we meet aesthetics as part of the human need for these displaced people. Yeah, that's a great, um, a great point, Paul. And something I didn't mention is that like one policy implication is that in most temporary shelters of any kind, there are actually quite strict restrictions on what um, individuals can do. And that's true, right, in affordable housing in the States, it's true in temporary settings that there's very like kind of strict don't modify um the place that you're in so even again the flexibility or agency to say like make it what you want right because there's there is an agency in that to say like I, I i want to make the walls purple um make them purple and there is right some like if we want people to be able to move on then they should be able to choose their wall color right like it's um there is some kind of again um just kind of freedom that it, it can give people I would add that there are some architects who are actually thinking about this just exactly the way that you talked about, Paul, which is that aesthetics must be built in immediately into the shelter that's being offered right at the start. So I think about the Japanese uh, architect uh, Shiguro Ban and his um, temporary housing for climate dis uh, climate displaced individuals and also war related refugees which are made from beautiful materials and cardboard uh tubing and uh the the assembly of these temporary shelters are easy enough for youth to actually be putting them together so we have some images of that there are going to be also other examples in the deck when we send it to you following our presentation. We've included a number of other references where the question of aesthetics specifically related to climate migration and rehoming have already been um, you know, thought through and assessed. 
And so I am looking at the time and I just want to make sure that um, there is something here uh, in the in the chat. Um, and so, uh, Emily, I'm, I'll leave you to share that with everyone, but please do feel free to reach out to us once you've had a chance to sit with this material. And I'm speaking to those of you who are live with us and those of you who might be watching the recording in the days to come. Uh, Stephanie and I, as we both said, this is the beginning of a process of gathering people's experiences and wisdom. And uh, we hope to be able to count on you to provide additional knowledge uh, from your grounded experience. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you both so much for such an impactful presentation. Um, I know that this will gain a lot of interest from our group, those of us who are here, and then those of us who will be watching later on this week. So I will share the recording of this lecture. Um, I will share the slides once I receive them from the speakers. Um, some follow-up information on the event that Semra just shared in the chat that will be on um, a, spe a special lecture on the importance of art and medicine at the Museum of the White Mountains. So I will send that information as well as the photo that she referenced today, I think would be great. And then for those who want to contact Devor and Stephanie, their contact information is here, but I will also send that in the follow-up email as well. So I know we have speakers from different time zones. So to be mindful of time, we'll end two minutes early here. So thank you so much again for giving us your time this evening. We really appreciate it and look forward to staying in touch. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.